Today, we'll be covering a fascinating topic. But before we do that, how would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. Let's get into the video. As dynasties go, the Romanovs are pretty legendary. Of the 18 Romanovs that took the Russian throne, two went down in history as great, and one was the last Tsar, meeting a famously tragic end. Few Russian dynasties are romanticized as much as the Romanovs, but what were they really like? Let's explore the rise and fall of the last imperial family to rule Russia. The Romanovs were high-ranking Russian aristocrats before they gained the title of Tsars. The first Romanov, Roman Yurov, was the father of Anastasia Romanovna, the wife of the first Russian Tsar, Ivan the Terrible. To honor the family name, as Anastasia had been a Tsarina, Roman's grandchildren, by his son Nikita, began using Romanov as their surname. Ivan the Terrible was succeeded by his son Theodore. The latter died childless, plunging Russia into a chaotic time known as the Time of Troubles. This period was essentially a power struggle between many factions of Russian society, with murder, peasant uprisings, and at least three people who claimed to be Theodore's half-brother Dmitri, who had died in 1591. After a lot of fighting, an alliance of landowners, Cossacks, and merchants called an assembly, known as the Zemsky Sabor, to elect a new Tsar and end the power struggle. In 1613, Michael Romanov, grandson to Nikita, was selected as Tsar. Michael was only around 16 at the time, was poorly educated, particularly in court affairs, and was not even present at the Zemsky Sabor. While Michael may seem like a bad choice to be the grand leader of Russia, there were several reasons that the nobles, or boyars, picked him. First, he was born from a noble family that had links to the previous dynasty through the beloved Tsarina Anastasia, and, as such, would probably be accepted by the people. Secondly, perhaps more importantly, a young man who knew little of politics and power struggles would probably be easy to control. Michael had grown up in a monastery after his mother and father, Cassinia and Feodor, were forced into monastic orders so they would not be able to lay claim to the throne of Russia. Michael's father had been taken to Poland and was being held there in captivity. The first Michael had heard about his ascension to the throne was when emissaries from Moscow arrived at his monastery. Reluctantly, he accepted and was coronated on July 21, 1613. At first, Michael left control of governmental affairs to his maternal relatives. Luckily, they were not entirely self-serving and restored order to Russia, suppressing internal uprisings and making peace with Sweden and Poland. In the sixth year of his reign, Michael's father was released and returned from Poland. He was then instated as Michael's co-ruler and a patriarch of the church. It is conceivable that Michael was only elected as his father could not rule on his own after being tonsured, having the top of his head shaved, and forced into religious orders. Michael acted more as a figurehead than a hands-on leader throughout his reign. When his father died in 1633, Michael again handed the reins of power to his mother's relatives. This delegation was beneficial for Russia, as the country prospered diplomatically, commercially, and culturally during this time. Michael's father, Feodor, had used the Zemsky Sabor to great effect, reformed the local government structure, and strengthened the institution of serfdom, which meant more financial stability for the ruling classes. Upon Michael's death in 1645, his son Alexis succeeded him. Like Michael, Alexis only received a superficial education and inherited the throne at 16. Following his father's footsteps, Alexis let his brother-in-law and former tutor take charge of state affairs. In 1648, a popular uprising in Moscow forced Alexis to exile his brother-in-law. Alexis called a Zemsky Sabor at the behest of the rebels. The assembly produced the Sobornoya Olyzhenye that contained a new set of laws, largely to do with legally defining serfdom which tied serfs to the estates on which they lived. Alexis drew much criticism for his reign from the peasants, deprived of the last of their freedom, and the cities due to expanding trade relations with the West which meant more economic competition. This underlying resentment caused numerous uprisings, including a peasant rebellion from 1667 to 1671. By all accounts, Alexis was a warm-hearted man and a popular ruler. 
the issues with his reign came from those he chose to take care of state matters. In this respect, he was not as lucky as his father had been. When Alexis suddenly died in 1676, he was succeeded by his eldest son, Feodor III. While Feodor III received a much better education than his predecessors, he was still in his teens when he ascended to the throne. Feodor III also suffered from poor health. At first, his uncle took the dominant position in his government, but this Tsar soon replaced his uncle with two courtiers with a similar educational background. Feodor III had studied Latin and Polish alongside his formal studies, and as a ruler, he and his courtiers promoted Latin literature, Roman Catholic doctrines, and Polish customs. After 1681, a prominent administrative figure named Vasily V. Galitsyn influenced him toward abolishing the traditional military system of Mestvichnestvo, under which military leaders were appointed due to their family's rank and not their skill. Feodor III died at the age of 20 and was succeeded by his younger half-brother, Ivan V, who suffered from mental and physical illnesses. He was named joint ruler after their sister, Sophia, encouraged a riot. Due to Ivan's incapacities and the fact that his half-brother Peter was only 10, Sophia ruled as regent. In 1689, Peter had managed to unseat Sophia during a revolt, but allowed the joint rule with Ivan to continue until Ivan's death. When Ivan died in 1696, Peter ruled alone and would become the first famous Romanov ruler, Peter the Great. He had been excluded from court during Sophia's regency as their maternal families were embroiled in a bitter feud about who should have power over the throne. As a result, Peter grew up free from the confines of palace life and had a wide and varied education that included military skills, carpentry, and blacksmithing. Peter was also more exposed to Western ideas as he was raised near a colony with many foreigners. He was a keen mathematician and strategist, developing an interest in travel and navigation at an early age. Peter had a keen interest in foreign policy and wanted to win access to foreign seas to allow Russian trade to spread. From 1695 to 1696, Peter initiated campaigns to capture Azov from the Turks. After initial failure, Peter persisted and built a fleet of ships that sailed down the Don River and successfully seized Azov. After this success, Peter went to Europe incognito, using the pseudonym Sergeant Pyotr Mikhailov. He studied shipbuilding as a ship's carpenter for the Dutch East India Company at Sardam and in Deptford, England, at the Royal Navy's dockyard. He familiarized himself with the Western world, visiting schools, museums, and factories. Peter also went to the Grand Assembly to request the British and Dutch join him in an alliance against Turkey. But the War of the Spanish Succession was looming, meaning the maritime powers of the West felt they had enough on their plates. Peter introduced many Western ideas to Russia, modernizing the country, enhancing its economic and industrial growth, and reforming education. He opened secular schools, and encouraged Russians to travel abroad for education. Peter modernized the Russian alphabet and introduced the Julian calendar to bring Russia's education and administration more in line with the West. Peter established the Table of Ranks, which meant that positions of power were not only open to those with a noble lineage, and introduced the governing Senate. Not all of Peter's decrees were logical, and due to his passion for westernization, he decreed that all his boyars would be clean-shaven and wear Western clothes. Any merchant wanting to keep their traditional Russian beard was forced to pay a beard tax, and anyone found to have skipped a payment was publicly shaved. Peter turned Russia, which had historically been a landlocked state, into a maritime power and founded St. Petersburg on the shores of the Baltic Sea to secure Russia's trade position. By the time Peter died in 1725, Russia was an empire and a major European power. During his life, Peter had decreed that the Tsar could name their successor rather than follow the tradition of the title passing to the eldest son, but he did not name a successor. On his death, his title went to his second wife, Catherine I, who died two years later. For the next 35 years, the throne changed hands five times, ending with Peter and Catherine's daughter Elizabeth in 1741. Elizabeth died in 1762 leaving the throne to her nephew, Peter III. Elizabeth had only assumed the throne after Ivan VI had named Empress Anna's successor. Ivan's mother was the German-born Anna Leopoldovna, and upon Empress Anna's death, assumed the regency for her son. Perhaps threatened by her legitimacy, Anna threatened to send Elizabeth to a convent. 
This act had the opposite effect to what Anna had wished, as it prompted Elizabeth, who up to this point had shown little interest in ruling, to stage a coup d'etat, after which she was proclaimed Empress of Russia. Elizabeth was more interested in fashion and extravagant interior design than the nation's ruling, but during her reign, Russia was stable and the arts flourished. Elizabeth also encouraged the development of education. When Elizabeth died in 1762, her nephew, Peter III, took the throne and was an unpopular ruler. He was obstinately pro-Prussian and immediately bade peace with Prussia, withdrawing Russia from the Seven Years' War. Born in Germany, he cared more about his homeland than Russia and alienated everyone in a position of power, including his wife, Catherine. Catherine was ambitious and clever, and although she was Prussian and only a Romanov through her marriage to Peter, her personality won her much support. Seeing her husband was a neurotic on the verge of alcoholism, Catherine realized that there was the distinct possibility that she could depose him and run Russia herself. Catherine had the support of the army, the court, and the public, and on July 9, 1762, she rallied her troops and proclaimed herself Empress of Russia. Peter III abdicated, and some say he was assassinated shortly after. Catherine II was crowned in September 1762 and ruled for 34 years, earning the title of Catherine the Great. As the ruler of Russia, she westernized Russia, leading it into European politics and culture, and extending Russian territory in Poland and Crimea. Although she had promised to end the inhumane practice of serfdom, she had strengthened it by the end of her reign. It was this disregard for the rights of the common people that would ultimately lead to the downfall of the Romanovs. When Catherine died in 1796, her son Paul I, whose father was probably Peter III, but might have been fathered by one of her lovers, took the throne. He was a tyrannical ruler and only lasted in the position less than five years before he was assassinated. His son, Alexander I, became Tsar the next day. Alexander's reign corrected many injustices set in place by his father, and he was a well-liked ruler, although, like his grandmother, he failed to abolish serfdom. Alexander I's major victory came in the form of defeating Napoleon's army, making him the most powerful sovereign in Europe. As a reward for defeating Napoleon, he was allowed to annex Poland, turning it into a kingdom with him as the monarch. His reign ended with his sudden death, and rumors circulated that he had departed to a Siberian retreat. These rumors were compounded by the fact that his courtiers refused to open his coffin after his death. Alexander I was succeeded by his brother, Nicholas I, in 1825, who was succeeded by his son, Alexander II, in 1855. The reign of Alexander II started at the peak of the Crimean War. Although many Romanov rulers had striven to update and westernize Russia, the Crimean War highlighted how far behind Europe Russia was. In response, Alexander II undertook drastic reforms, emancipating the serfs, reducing class privilege, and fostering economic development. Despite seeming more liberal than his predecessors, Alexander II was primarily an autocrat. After an attempt on his life in 1866, he started a period of repression which led to further uprisings, and revolutionaries killed him on March 13, 1881. Alexander's successor, Alexander III, missed the signs of things to come, believing that his father's assassination had resulted from liberal policies. As such, he opposed a representative government and promoted Russian nationalism. Alexander III was the penultimate monarchical Russian ruler, and his son Nicholas II would be the last Russian emperor. Nicholas II took the throne in 1894. His military education and temperament did not suit the position he was born to fill. Nicholas preferred the privacy of family life to public appearances, and his devotion to his wife caused much controversy. Under her influence, he came under the sway of faith healers like Grigory Rasputin. Nicholas also allowed his wife and Rasputin to manipulate him into opposing any reforms proposed by Prime Minister Pyotr Stolypin. The strange power dynamic alienated the Russian people, causing civil unrest which led to the Russian Revolution of 1917. This revolution ended Russia's Romanov line and monarchical rule when Nicholas and his entire family were killed. While it is often contested as to whether any Romanovs are alive today, many point to the descendants in both male and female lines, and some which carry the Romanov name. The Romanovs were installed as nobles who would be easy to control 
and went on to produce some of the most well-loved czars in Russian history. However, their stubborn resistance to social reform eventually alienated them from their people, causing their ultimate downfall. To learn more about the Romanovs, check out our book, The Romanovs, A Captivating Guide to the Last Imperial Dynasty to Rule Russia and the Impact the Romanov Family Had on Russian History. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.